Hey guys, before we get into today's episode, we have a special announcement. Charlie Kirk is coming this Sunday, February 14th at 10 a.m. He'll be sharing a message of hope in light of the political darkness. So please join us at 10 a.m. this Sunday, February 14th. The doors will be opening at 9.15, so please be sure to get there to get a seat. Seating is limited. And praying that you can join us for this special event. Thanks so much, guys. Hey guys, thanks so much for joining us on another episode of Calvary Conversations. My name is Mariah, and I'm here with Pastor Craig Roeders. What's up? Today, our guest is Joshua Lewis, the host of The Remnant Radio, and we had such a great conversation with him that it turned into a two-part. So this is our part one conversation with Joshua Lewis. Joshua, thanks so much for joining us today. Hey, thanks so much for having me. So we know that you are in your daughter's room, stuck with the Rona. How's that been? Uh, It's uh, pretty rough. Three days, um, at least, maybe four days. Um, No, it's been three. Yeah, uh, I'm I'm in a room that cannot be 12 feet by 12 feet. It is so small. (laughs) Um, And I'm so tired of being in here. Uh, We picked up a couple of things uh, from the studio, sit in the background, lights, and... uh, a portable microphone so we do when we uh, when we go on location so uh hopefully my voice uh stays uh intact for the full interview yeah. uh yesterday it was rough yesterday it was real bad so uh praying that uh sounds good we it won't be too too, too distracting yeah, that'll be good today your sound like... voice sounds good <laughs> did you good. did you uh how so you how are you gonna do a full week what's the the plan to be in the room a full week of oh, of okay. shows okay. from this room yeah. oh yeah so so I think the way that it goes is once you stop having symptoms, 10 days of quarantine after oh, that. Um, so that's that's the plan, I think. Oh, not fun. Well, today we want to talk about the gifts, and we would like to talk about um, all those different things about how we need to earnestly desire the gifts, you know, but not like chase after them in a way where we're getting into like we need the signs and wonders. So we would like you to first talk about um, who you are and what you do. So why... Are you on our show today? What is your <laughs> credentials? That's a question for you, yes. uh, honestly. Uh, there are more qualified people, but uh, I'm the host of a theology program called Remnant Radio. Um, we we stream Monday, Tuesday, Wednesdays. Um, we have pastors and teachers from different churches and denominations on our show, and we talk theology. Now, one of the things that we've um, we've got three categories that we hit on. We'll talk about theology. Um, so eschatology, soteriology, new perspective on Paul, a penal substitution, we'll cover all of the theological spectrum in Gambit. And we want to talk about church history. So we're going to talk about, um, you know, Origen and Irenaeus and uh, uh, Augustine. We want to talk about the history of denominations and the history of movements and theology. Uh, and then we're also going to talk about uh, the gifts of the Spirit. The reason we wanted to do this is because a lot of the spaces um, that were talking theology online, especially on YouTube, um, were cessationist platforms, and we have much love for our cessationist brothers. Uh, We think that they're godly, that they're saved, that they love the Lord. Uh, But um, we wanted to uh, experiment with uh, a theology program that, that that helped our charismatic brothers and sisters realize you didn't have to check your brain at the door mm. uh, to practice the gifts of the Spirit, but you can be passionate uh, and love the Lord God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Yeah. And you don't have to separate those out. You don't have to love God with all of your uh, heart and soul and not love with God with all of your mind and strength. Yeah. So we want to make sure that we uh, have a holistic approach. And we've actually found that it's really really been quite helpful. Um, you know, we were doing these videos on prophecy and we realized that, man, we've done all these videos on sovereignty and we've done all these videos on, um, uh, you know, on soteriology in particular and talking about that sovereignty piece. But man, uh, what you know about other areas of theology really affects prophecy, yeah. right? It really affects your, your, your view of the gifts of the spirit and, and the claims that you're going to actually make about God um, based off of how you make how you practice prophecy, it's actually really interwoven together. So uh, we think it's important that we don't just have conversations about the gifts, but we have conversations about theology proper. Uh, we have conversations about scripture, um, and we we don't just pick the portions that we like. And that's actually been really helpful in talking about the gifts of the Amen. Spirit. Amen. We love that. Like we don't, especially with Calvary, we don't want to just pick and choose, do little topicals to go verse by verse, but also. Like, I see that in your guys' program, how you guys do that so well. And so we're thankful to have you on. Um, so we would like to, for you to share a little bit of your history, your background. And so you can walk through that. But 
to start off with the first question, what type of church did you grow up in? Okay, uh, yeah, I grew up in an Assemblies of God church, um, and in many ways we were um, a not a typical Assemblies of God church in that my my senior pastor was a man by the name of Steve Hill. So um, I grew up at Heartland World Ministries Church at 6300 North Beltline <laughs> in Irving, Texas. Uh, that's I was very involved in that church. <laughs> so uh, uh, Steve, many of you will know if you're that are watching um, from the Brownsville revival. Um, John uh, Kilpatrick um, pastored a church in Brownsville, uh, Pen- uh, Brownsville uh, uh, around Pensacola, Florida. Um, and Steve, on 1995, a Father's Day, showed up at Brownsville, Pensacola, um, preached a sermon, and the power of God was present. Uh, many came to the Lord, and uh, there was some manifestations that took place there uh, that hadn't been happening prior. Um, and that was the day that they they said that that revival began. And for the next five years, I want to say it was like 1.4 million people went through Brownsville. Um, people who were planting churches around the world, people who were doing evangelism around the world. Um, uh, there was, a, for all intents and purposes, a great move of God. Mm-hmm. Um, lots and lots of people came got saved from that movement. Um, Dr. Michael Brown, uh, that many people know today, is kind of one of the charismatic guys who's who's uh, uh, who's wearing a seatbelt, right? Who, 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 who's trying to be careful with the gifts. Um, he, he came out of that movement. Steve moved to Dallas, Fort Worth. Um, uh, Colleyville is, I think, where the first church was planted. Um, and then we moved to uh, there in Irving. I was discipled in that church um, from the time I was around. I get this number wrong all the time. Like my mom was like, no, you weren't 12. So maybe I was like 14. So I said 12 to 21, but recently she's like, you weren't 12. <laughs> so I think it was 14 to 21. Uh, it's my teen years for sure. And uh, uh, yeah, so I was there probably the most impactful time in my Christian walk was there. Um, I, I was discipled. Um, once I graduated high school, I went to the internship program that they had with the youth program. I was discipled by Daniel Norris, the youth pastor there at the church. Um, and I still to this day speak with Daniel. I called him um, just yesterday, actually, working on a project, uh, someone who had got healed in one of our services. I was like, hey, do you have video footage of this? Because I would like to talk about it and show it. So like, we're actually still friends and um, have a good relationship still to this day. So um, now there would be, I think the question is asking like, hey, what kind of church did you grow up in as it was an assemblies church? Um, in many regards, we were like the assemblies. In many regards, we weren't because when you have a name like Steve Hill, you can kind of just do what you want, and the denomination is just proud to have you on their team, right? Uh, so we didn't really go to the youth camps. We actually did our own youth camp. We didn't really part- participate in any of the, like, fine arts or any of the other things that, like, typical assemblies churches yeah. do. Um, so in many regards, we just weren't like normal assemblies churches. Uh, and because of his name, we did attract um, quite a few in the prophetic and charismatic community. So like, I would say that the church as a whole, I wouldn't define Heartland as hyper charismatic, but they did have relationships with people who would come in that I would classify as hyper charismatic. Yeah. Um, so uh, it was a very unique experience. Uh, a lot of things I learned that I liked and a lot of things I learned that I didn't. Um, and uh, still honestly processing through a lot of that today still. Yeah. Uh, but Did you did you experience yeah, the journey? Browns? Because I remember Brown's Revival had a lot of the holy laughter. I remember when, what's the name? Yeah. Was a what was his name Brown? Was it Brown? Who was the guy who's the who would walk around kind of stoic, kind of a bigger uh, guy like me? I want to say that was Rodney, yeah, Rodney Howard, Howard Brown, and I think Rodney Howard Brown was in Toronto, if I'm not mistaken. Well, I, I don't know he that was, he. I, I mean, he maybe was in he, Florida too, huh? He might have visited, yeah. but he he wasn't one of the main speakers. Okay. I don't think laughter was a marker, and again, I don't don't quote me on this. I think it might have been present, but it wasn't like a regular marker mm-hmm. there at Brownsville. Uh, a slain in the spirit was a big deal uh, at Brownsville. Um, but the, 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 the biggest marker of Brownsville, I mean, these videotapes, you can just watch the videotapes, altar calls at Brownville, Brownsville. Steve would just give, I mean, Steve Hill could read the ingredients off of a cereal box and then do an altar call and people would get saved. I mean, there was just like, um, and I know people are listening to that going, that's not how people get saved, Josh. Like they have to they have to repent of their sin. Like I know, I'm just it was an illustration. Yeah. Okay. No, we we know um, we used to say you could say someone's lights were on in the parking lot at Grace Chapel where I was in Tucson and people would get saved. So it was kind of like the, the yeah. hippie move the Jesus movement and anyone, you know, they just you give it like I remember Raul Reese once said during the Jesus movement, he was speaking for Greg Laurie and he said 
He goes, he goes, you know what? I don't have time to do an altar call at the end. My message is too long, so I'm just going to do it now. And like 300 kids came forward just without even any preaching. Yeah. Hmm. Well, that's kind of, I mean, um, Brownsville is just marked by repentance uh, of sin and faith in Christ. So um, you can you can make all kinds of claims about people being slain, um, but you can't listen to a single sermon of Brownsville and not hear the gospel, mm-hmm. that you're a sinner, that you're lost, you're in need of a savior, and you need to repent for your sins. Um, and you can you can say, man, this was out of order, that was wrong. And I might, I might agree with you in some of those areas, but um, the marker of what was being preached was faith and repentance, which is, which is actually what's caused it to be very difficult for me to process a lot of the manifestations that I saw, because the, the manifestations at Heartland, Steve got sick. Uh, he died of cancer, um, but he got sick um, after pastoring, I want to say for like six years or seven years, something like that. Um, so he, he left, and then the church was kind of like being collectively pastored by a bunch of guys, and no one really knew who was in charge, or at least that's what it felt like. And there was just a lot of things that just happened. Um, and there was in particular conferences where, you know, you know, people were on the floor and, and wailing and screaming. And like, you know, I was 17, you know, 18 going, am I, do I have to be the one? Like, is it, is it me? Like, am I doing, am I doing this? You know? So I go up into people's ear and be like, Hey, stop screaming. You're being a distraction. And they would stop oddly enough. Right. It's like the Holy spirit wasn't making them do that. It's like, it was just someone being fleshy and you're like, Hey man, I love you. I really believe God's touching you, but you're distracting from what God's doing over yeah. here. You got to stop. Yeah. And they would Joshua, stop. Yeah, so exactly. wait, did you ever get the, this is what I used to get when I, I was at a four square church when the Toronto was heading in about 93, 94. And, um, uh, and uh, I would tell people when they, this one guy was barking and I told them to stop as the assistant pastor. And he says, you're quenching the spirit, brother. Mm-hmm. Did you ever get that one? Or are you, people are pretty respectful. Oh, I mean, most of the time, cause again, I'm, I'm a young guy. Mm-hmm. Like there was a person on the floor. They didn't even know who I was. They didn't see my face. You know, I'm like whispering in their ear, like, hey, can you please stop? Like, you're being a distraction. You know, like, they didn't know if I was a pastor. You know, oh, they were, they had no clue who I was. So, yeah, yes, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the voice of God. Um, stop. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, um, I, I, I mean, I, I was really, um, though, though there were things that made me uncomfortable, like physically uncomfortable that I would see, um, I was not very vocal. I had one conversation um, with my mentor, with Daniel. And I was just like, why, like, why is that a move? Like, like that girl, she fell over, she shook violently. And then we know that she took like, um, I can't, I can't, I can't ex- tell some of these stories without like giving out too much detail. Um, with them going straight back into a lifestyle of sin and rampant sin yeah. at that, right? Like committing horrible heinous yeah. acts, right? Um, young men. You know, like weeks later after, you know, falling to the ground, shaking violently, practicing sexual immorality, like, vi- like really, really bad stuff. Like, um, and, and it was always very difficult for me to comprehend and understand, like, if this is God's spirit doing this, why is it that we are able to just go right back into normal sin and not have any fear of God? Uh, that was always very hard for me to comprehend. Yeah. Um, and to this day, I have a hard problem with it because um, the gospel was preached, mm-hmm. right? So, like, I have a hard time thinking that a demon was, like, touching yeah. people um, because it's only by the Spirit of the Lord that we cry that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is Christ. Um, and that was being proclaimed regularly. So it, it, there's there's... There's definitely confusion that I have on the subject. There's definitely a mixture that I'm trying to work through. I think most most of this was psychosomatic. I think most of what was taking place was just not being pastored. People weren't coming alongside and saying, hey, you don't have to shake like this. Hmm. Like the gift of the prophet is subject to the prophet. Like I think the Holy Spirit's probably moving on you. Um, but you don't have to respond this way. Um, there was a young girl in our church named Channing um, when I was a youth pastor. I love this girl to death. Still one of my favorite students. Um, and, uh, she was, I want to say she was 14 at the time. And when the Holy spirit, she would feel the Holy spirit on her. She would do this, like, you know, the Lou Engle. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So she would, she would do a little, little sway and then she would like shake her hands like this. <laughs> and she asked me a question, like I didn't confront her, you know, but like I'm, I do Q and a at the end of my youth sessions and she's like, Hey, what's with the shaking and the jerking and the stuff like this? And I just told her, well, um, I think people, um, don't know that they don't have to yeah. do that. 
Again, the gift of the prophet is subject to the prophet. Like one of the fruit of the spirit is self-control. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can actually feel the Holy Spirit and think you have to respond a certain way uh, and see other people doing it and actually believe you're supposed to respond that way and you don't have right. to. She grew up to be, again, one of the most gifted, prophetic, evangelistic, I mean, just rock solid students to this day is phenomenal, still experiences the Lord, um, but doesn't do all of the wacky yeah. stuff because someone just to tell her, hey, you don't have exactly. to. Exactly. Um, and just pastoring just so graciously like that really, I think, would, would have solved a lot of what I was seeing that was disorderly. Um, I don't think I have, I have a hard time trying to explain this stuff as demonic as much as it just needed to be pastored. Yeah, that's good. And like for me, I've had an experience where I like, I guess people say like went out in the power, like fall back, whatever they want to say. Sure. And yet for me, it's how I looked at it is like I had a choice too. like it's not like oh, I was just like slain, like smacked in the head. Mm -hmm. I mean, some people do that, but like, but I think that (laughs) what I realized is like, it's like with speaking in tongues because like we speak in tongues and it's like, you're not like, oh, I can't control it. Like you can't control the words coming out. It's like, like you said, there's self-control. Like you can, you have a choice. And so what would you say to those people who like, and maybe you experience this, but like who they feel like people, they go to a certain you know, maybe a charismatic meaning and people are having them like, you know, fall on the power and just go back or whatever. But it's like, if someone isn't like, and they kind of make you seem like you're not receiving it or that, like, what would you say to that? We should first ask, what do you feel about that yeah. since you came out of assembly? Because, yeah, you know, Calvary, where I go, you know, we don't believe in that at all, they Mm-mm. say. I mean, I've experienced it twice. Um, and then I, I'm asking you as I say it because like I experienced it with uh, you probably know him from Texas. I probably I saw him in Texas. Austin was a uh, um, what's his name from uh, the the German guy, um, oh. Todd White's guy, uh, Reinhard Bonnke. Yes. So Reinhard Bonnke prayed for me. Here I am, newly <laughs> charismatic, so I don't know all the gig, you know. And uh, he just prays for me. Goes Lord bless him. And all of a sudden I just felt like this electricity. <laughs> that was a good and I was like, was whoa. I was like, what is, I didn't go out, but I mean, I felt like literally electricity. electricity. Like if you've ever been shocked, I mean, I felt it and I was like, and I felt it for like two hours. I'm like, this is crazy. You know? And I was kind of freaking out about it. I wasn't like, Ooh, I received the power. I mean, I was just like, this is <laughs> wild, you know? And then one other time, like Mariah, this guy prayed for me. His name's uh, Dick Joyce. He's passed away, but he spoke like at Bethel and stuff. Mm-hmm. And he came to our church at Foursquare church. And he prayed for me and he had, he did a, you know, uh, called me out, you know, had a prophetic word for me that was right on and everyone was laughing because it was, a, he read my mail and then all of a sudden he prayed for me and ex- like Mariah, it was one of those things where, cause I'm like a big peaceful. boy, you know, I don't want to fall back and kill any children or anything. So I was like, you know, so I was just like, but I just, you know, I kind of like, I could have stopped it, yeah. but then, you know, like, I felt like, ah, oh, you know, it was kind of cool. And, uh, but I've seen people, like you said, where I've seen people just do this, like a line, you know, in front of the church. Yeah. And all of a sudden I saw, you know, and people say, you know, I kind of move sometimes in the prophetic, but I just saw this kid that I knew. I was a youth pastor and I said, bro, you went out and that wasn't the Lord. You didn't, you just did it, you know? Yeah. And he said, like, yeah, you're right, others. man. So what, what's your, since you've kind of gone the full gamut, what's your perspective? And I like to say it, I call it going out under the power because I don't know who wants to really be slain in the spirit. I don't really want to be slain, you know? Yeah. I don't need that. I don't like the verbiage. You know, I like, I like, you know, cause I think I asked God once I said, God, what is this thing? If it has any purpose, what is it? And I feel like the Lord spoke to me that it's kind of like getting in a jacuzzi. You know, when you get in a jacuzzi at first, you're like, ah, you're like, you feel like your flesh is going to burn off sometimes. And it's kind of like when God kind of reveals himself, it sort of overwhelms people. And that's kind of the way I look at it. It's like when you really do have the presence of God, kind of like when Solomon dedicated the temple, it's kind of whoa. Or when yep. when when Isaiah saw the Lord, he fell like a dead man. Or when John sees the Lord in First uh, Revelation one, you know, and people say what you know, it, but it's where you're just kind of overwhelmed by, by the glory of God. And it's not that he slams you into a wall no. like some people, but it's just where you kind of go, wow. You kind of like, if you remember video games or the, the pinball games where you could shake it real hard, it would tilt and it would stop playing. It's kind of like that where you're kind of like a fainting goat, you know, you know, but it's like, anyway, so what do you think? Of that? So oh, you're going, like, I so think it's all demonic. You're crazy. No, okay, <laughs> <laughs> no I've, I've got a video on Slain in the Spirit with my friend Matthew Esquivel on our channel that people can get a longer explanation for this. But um, 
uh, I would just in, in summation, I would say that there is a biblical precedent in the Old Testament um, for the presence of God filling an atmosphere, filling a, a space um, in such a tangible way that people are unable to stand. Mm-hmm. So that's what I that's what I call it, right? Like I'm, I was just unable to stand. I don't call it slain in the spirit. I don't say the Holy Spirit knocked me over. Like I just, um, it, I didn't fall. I just couldn't stand yeah. anymore. <laughs> just over, kind of overwhelmed and, and, by the presence of God. Yeah. Yeah. So the spirit filled the temple. Yeah. Um, Moses, when he anointed everything and set it in its right place, it's actually a tabernacle. Uh, and then the spirit filled that place. Solomon is one that you mentioned. Um, and, and in both accounts, um, the people were not able to stand in that place. And, and we're in the temple of the Lord now um, in that regard. And the spirit dwells in us. Um, and I have no problem, especially with the laying on of hands, because we see that through scripture, um, uh, at least in uh, in the book of Acts, that the spirit um, is administered by the apostles to the people in Samaria through the laying on of hands. Have you received yet the Holy Spirit? Um, so it, it seems as if that um, uh, a point of contact is acceptable for the Holy Spirit to minister. Now, if um, the Holy Spirit ministers to a person through laying on of hands and they happen to fall, I have no biblical reason to say that that is unbiblical since there is precedent for the Holy Spirit moving and people not being able to stand. Yeah. That being said, am I going to then create a movement where I'm going to teach and train people how to fall and how to get caught and like all this? Um, I don't know that that's necessary. Again, it does seem to lend itself to a psychosomatic, yeah. you know, um, yep. where, where we tell people, uh, Hey guys, uh, I'm preaching the sermon, but I want to let you know, you come up after the sermon, I'm going to lay my hands on you. When I touch you, the power of God is going to hit you. You know, we just keep telling them over Unless and over, you're something's going to happen, <laughs> put my hands on you. And, yeah, yeah. And, and then the people that don't, you know, don't like fall, just receive it. They just like sway you and they hold, they put your hand on you and they just kind of sway you and just, you know, receive it. And, and they, they put their legs behind your knees. Push your back. <laughs> yeah, I mean. I've heard all kinds of I, I had a guy, I promise you, church. Joshua, that literally hit my head all the way back to the back of the church to where, I mean, like, probably mm-hmm. it's a big church, and it was like, yeah. you know, 300 feet at least, 400 feet, and uh, and I said to him, you hit me one more time, I'm hitting you back. I mean, this is ridiculous. <laughs> like, you know, like yeah. you know, I'm not going that's, out. You know what I mean? It, it was just like. That's what I would tell people to that's do. That's crazy. Um, if, if, you're, if you're dealing with someone who is trying to push you over, um, you, you can honestly have someone who doesn't realize what's happening. They've just prayed for 300 people, and they're not being careful with how they're placing their hands on people. And you can say, hey, um, you know, in the moment, once they're praying for you, um, like if their hand is on you and it feels heavy, just ask them verbally, oh, oh could you please not push so hard? Or could you please not whatever? And it, it's totally possible that they're not aware um, we want to we want to have humble hearts and not assume that everyone's trying to manipulate yeah, exactly. you and what's going on. Uh, but I'll tell you what, um, that that'll straighten someone up real quick, <laughs> whether it's on accident or on purpose. If you're very vocal about it in that moment, there's people around um, and they can hear you say, oh, please don't push me. Um, <laughs> yeah. They, they stop they'll the stop. You know? Yeah, because um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there, there are people. Um, uh, there are people who are, they've got no problem, but I've also, I've had some wacky experiences, guys. Oh, yeah, me too. Uh, yeah. there, there's been some times that I've, uh, I was walking really close with the Lord for a season. Um, and you know, you're not walking close now. I, I go up to Bible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not, not like that. Okay. Um, uh, I don't know. I, I would spend like six to eight hours in prayer oh, wow. a day, That's, like yeah, just ridiculous amounts of time in prayer. Um, and, uh, so, so when I say no, I just, yes, <laughs> absolutely no. Uh, I don't have that kind of time. I got a family. <laughs> exactly. Um, when you're young and single, you could do anything. <laughs> a job. Yeah. yeah. You know, so I, I would go up, to, I would like wake up at 4 a.m. and go to my church and pray for hours and hours. And, um, and, uh, yeah. And there were times that I would, I would walk into a room and, um, there, there would be people who would fall over. Hmm. Um, and, and like, I got, I got nothing. I've got no category for that. Yeah. There's nothing in me. There's no holiness or piety in myself. Um, I've got I've got nothing. I'm an empty, weak, sinful man. But I've seen the Holy Spirit do things that I don't. I can't explain. Exactly. Um, and and I think that we we don't need to create systems and create modes uh, and create these theological structures to where we're trying to um, we're trying to make these things normative. Yeah. Yeah. Right? We can just say, Hey, the Holy Spirit did something, and we're okay with that. Um, and, and when things get out of hand, when, when, when things begin to 
become a distraction yeah. from the gospel. Yeah. They start pointing people to an individual who has the slain in the spirit anointing or the, the, the whatever anointing and gets your eyes off of Christ. And hey, the, the big revival is just coming in and he's going to give us all an impartation. And, and we're really excited about this guy. And we're not excited about Christ and him crucified and, and the sin that he's removed from us. Um, then it's a distraction, um, which is why, um, you know, I don't I don't again, I don't talk about this stuff on my channel frequently uh, because I don't. I don't want to use my experiences in my past as a way to, wow, that sounds really cool. I want to pursue that, that thing that he got, which I don't, I don't even walk in that, you know, like there was just something that the Lord did in my life. I'm thrilled that the Lord did it in my life, but like, I don't want even that experience to distract me from the cross. Um, so and it's, it's really what I like, really like about Joshua, what you're saying is how you're a student of the word. You really want to, the fullness of God, right, yeah. and his what His Word says, but yet you're you know you're saying I don't want to you know because a lot of times when you, it seems like people who are real intellectual or kind of Baptisty, which I was, that you kind of have bash. to throw out <laughs> the gifts, yeah, because it's too <coughs> crazy. But it's neat that you're wrestling with the balance because, like you know, I, I have a story too. You're gonna love his story because you are a Baptist, right? But I had this Baptist boy, so here I'm a newly charismatic. I've been a charismatic about a year. And this Baptist boy comes to my youth group and he's trembling. He's literally shaking and not because of the power. He's just scared. And he says, I was praying and he was praying a lot. And he said, the Lord told me to go to you and to get you to pray for me to receive the gift of tongues. Well, I had a, you know, not to get in my story, but I had a real issue with tongues. I was taught by Dallas Theological Seminary people. The tongues is not for today. It's either demonic or made mm -hmm. up. So it was just really scary for me. And so I had such compassion on this guy because I knew that fear. So I just said, oh, bless him, Lord. I just did this. And I put my hand towards him. Didn't even touch him. Put my hand about a yeah. foot in his, by his face. I said, bless him. I just said, and I was just compassion. I didn't even expect anything. And he literally flew. We had these old steel chairs. He flew over the chair and hit the you second chair, him? hit his head so hard. I mean, he's like, bang. Oh, no. I mean, I was like, oh, my. I was expecting the guy to have a broken neck and sue us. And all of a sudden, um, I'm just, we're all just stunned. Like, I didn't know what, I know what to do with that. And all of a sudden, I go and I say, hey, bro. And I'm tapping him and he's speaking in tongues. So, I mean, and I just, yeah. and I didn't go, I knew when I laid my hands in the air. I mean, I was right, just right, as right. shocked and freaked out as he was. And he spoke in <laughs> tongues and then he just left. I never saw the guy again. It was the craziest thing. Yeah. And so, like you said, I don't know what to do that. And I never have done that since. I don't have a, you know, chair flipping anointing, but I, you know, you kind of right. go, I mean, my friends were looking at me like, whoa, dude. But it was, you know, and, and I've never, I've probably prayed for in my 39 years of ministry, probably maybe four people have gone, done something kind of like that. And, you know, but it's just, it just sort of, it wasn't, I had no idea it was going to happen. It just got, and so and this there is, it is. I mean, you just, I didn't, but I didn't go on the road saying I have a, you know, I'm going to send you flying a foot in the air. You know what I mean? So but anyway. And, th and that's, that's the danger, right? The danger is that we, we have received the testimony of Jesus from Christ to the apostles, from the apostles to the church. And we have received the faith that has been passed down to the saints. And, and we receive this historic faith. And the, the, the difficult part is that when God does something unique, that we then take that unique thing and we try to make it a normative practice, yeah. right? So um, the Apostle Paul, um, or, so, or Peter and Paul, for example, one's healing guys with a shadow, the other one's like sending handkerchiefs <laughs> to people, yeah. they're getting healed. Um, Jesus picks up mud and throws it in some guy's eyes and he gets healed. Uh, but what we don't do now um, as New Testament believers is create a, um, uh, a shadow healing ministry, right? Where we line people up and we shine a, a bright spotlight on someone yeah. and have their shadow pass over people because of something that the Lord had done. We don't then make it a normative thing and make it a teaching and a new doctrine, right? Because the doctrine has already been passed down. We don't need to go beyond what is written in the scriptures. Um, we, we can just practice uh, what God has given us through the Holy Scriptures. So, um, you know, I don't pick up mud and throw it in some guy's <laughs> eyes just because Jesus did it when I see a blind person. Um, ju that's just because God did something then doesn't mean that's the exact way that God is going to do it now. So when I practice the gift of healing today, I have the sick come forward 
We have the elders come up. We anoint with oil and pray the prayer of faith as the scriptures command us to. Um, Now, that's right, James 5. Now, if, if there is something unique that the Lord does that is outside of that biblical pattern, great, God can do miracles, but I don't need to create that experience and, and teach it and disseminate it as it's a practice. So again, slain in the spirit, I'm not going to create a doctrine around it. I'm not going to create a practice around it and teach it to the local church because it's unnecessary um, because we already have the scriptures. We have the doctrines uh, of the apostles and, uh, and of Christ. So um, we've got to create categories to say, okay, God can do things by his sovereign will, let him do things, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but then but then to to understand that um, uh, yeah, that we, we don't we don't create these new practices, yeah. these new things that the Lord does as a normative. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I think and I think too, Joshua, is that we as I was saying, you know, the one thing on healing, if you remember the the, the Exodus fifteen twenty six, I really love the beginning of it because it's in the old testament when the Holy Spirit came upon people, didn't really live in people. But he says, if you will listen to my voice Amen. and do what's right in my eyes. I mean, so the key is, I think, when you're praying for someone, right, is to really, right, listen to the Holy Spirit to say, what, how do you want yeah. to pray? You don't just pray. Remember, like, Wimber kind of had his steps of how you pray, you mm-hmm. interview and all. Yeah. And it's like, but I see is really, you know, we need to get back to, I mean, of course, we have the word. We want to do things biblically, but we also need to be led by the Holy Spirit to say, Lord, what are you doing here? How, how would you like me to pray? We know we lay hands. We know anoint. But is there something you like to speak? Like, you know, forgive. Remember, James, it says 514, that if there's any sin that you'll speak. So maybe you could have a yep. word of knowledge or something or just lead them saying, are you, un, is there unforgiveness? You know what I mean? But it's, it, I see whenever I try to do a system, I don't do very well. But if I really just say, Lord, move with compassion care about people then you can kind of hear the lord say something and you know i've seen that you know just silly things and i was saying this week because you know everyone's saying that trump was going to be our president second term and i was saying you know we know in part and prophesy in part in what deuteronomy 18 if someone is a prophet what they say will come true if it doesn't come true guess what they did not move in the authority of the lord so i mean but i I love the prophets now well the stars weren't aligned right and you didn't have enough faith it's like bro if it was god it would happen it didn't happen so guess what you missed it it was more wishful thinking than than a prophetic word and so anyway but that's what i see as you know trying because you know as calvary we kind of word 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 and we've gone more away from the gifts yep but I'm really seeing that when God has moved supernaturally natural is when I'm really led by the spirit Amen. according to the word, you know what I mean? Amen. And I can flow yeah. in that. And, and we need that because like you said, when there's a system or we mm-hmm. create a culture of, as I lay my hands on you, you will yeah. feel the fire. <laughs> that's not really, <laughs> no. that's well, we also don't want to create a, a piety and laity system that looks like the Roman Catholic <laughs> yeah. church where we have the leaders who have access to God and they have to come to us to get, to God. Um, that, that's dangerous yeah. and scary. Um, yeah. So I, I would, I would really want to push against that as well, that we create some kind of hierarchy that the gifts Only go with us. are some kind of hierarchical system. Yeah. yeah. Some kind of class system that says, Hey, you've, you've got, you've really got access to God. Um, uh, but I don't. Um, so I've got to come to you to get the stuff. Yeah. Um, we got to be careful uh, of a lot of that. Yeah. And I've seen a lot of uh, young adults in our church who have left a certain like church and denomination because that very thing was happening. They were making them feel like if you don't speak in tongues, if you don't fall out in the power and all that slain in the spirit, then like you can't be in ministry. Something's wrong with you. And they've been really disillusioned and they think it's God. So then they kind of stop talking to God. They're not intimate with the Lord and they're not like praying as much and they're, they're not going to church. And so that's why it was cool. Like when we were able to talk to them and explain like, you know, all these things that's not saying, because then they see the abuse of it and then they don't want to use it at all. They're just like freaked out right. and they're upset. Mm. And so what we tell them is like, I like this Paul Washer video I was sending to my friends and he was talking about, he's like, my Baptist brothers, he's like, just because someone like does something strange doesn't mean that if it's not against the word of God and contradicting, like we can't just like throw it out. And he was just explaining how we need to be, like my dad was saying, we need to be led by the Holy Spirit and sometimes the Holy Spirit tells us to do things that are like a little weird, but it should never contradict the word of God. It should never pull people away from God and like put like repentance and like going to God and humbling themselves. And I think that's the key with when I see people who are more 
um, because we're charismatic, but people that are more to the extreme, when they feel like, like you said, like a super apostle, like they feel like untouchable. And if you say something like, hey, that that seemed a little off or like you kind of hit me a little hard or that was a little weird, but they say you're quenching the spirit. But when I see people who are like, I'm sorry, or like humble themselves, that's when I know it's not about them and they're doing their best to like be led by the Holy Spirit to minister. But, and that's what I would say to people. It's like, we believe that, you know, we believe like speaking in tongues is for today with interpretation. We believe um, (coughs) prophecy, word of knowledge, all these things like in first Corinthians 14, decently in order. But that's what I would like you to share. Like, how would you, or how did you kind of get into then more of the balance or what is now your views of, you know, the gifts or prophecy even like in tongues? What is your view on that today? Okay, well, sorry, um, I said a lot. So <laughs> I don't even know if you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can, I like can COVID. I, uh, <laughs> no, I, I got it. Um, with the, uh, the, the conversation that we just had about, you know, experiences turning into normative practices, um, uh, all came to a head for me when I was traveling with my buddy. So uh, 21, at 20, I became a youth pastor at a church at St. Elmo, Illinois. Um, at 21, I married my buddy, Jake. In, in Illinois, he's a senior pastor, decides to move down to Texas to do evangelism, and uh, I moved with him. So I, I resigned as the youth pastor, and we did evangelism for three years together. And um, while we were here, there was a church that we went to. Um, I won't ma- mention the name of the church, um, but while we're there, uh, there are uh, there's a there all the all the ushers like. Are, are, I guess they're called deacons there, but they're all covered in uh, red suits, right? They all have red suits on. They're all matching. I'm like, okay, that's odd, but whatever. You got red suits, so you know who the deacons are. I go, okay, cool. And then we, we go in, we sit down, and during worship, there's these high priestesses who are got like flag waving, and they're dressed like high priestesses. I know what the the, the articles of clothing look like, and that, that kind of threw me off. I didn't really like it all that much, but I was like, okay, it's part of their culture, right? Jacob got up to preach, and as he was preaching, he would say something really good. And the row of ushers, the front the front row full of red suits, would pull out shofars and blow <laughs> shofars as to say amen to the preaching. Wow. And I was like, that's too yeah. far. Like, it's I'm, I'm I, you've lost to me at this point. Like, I can't even pay attention because <laughs> I'm just waiting for you jokers to blow a shofar. We're here. going shofar, you know? so shofar good. So good. <laughs> 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 that's, that's my new line. I stole that. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> so, so, and then... And then uh, uh, at the end of the service, Jacob gets done preaching, and the red suits go into the back of the church, and they come out with the Ark of the Covenant on their shoulders, and they're playing this loud wow. music on stage. They come dancing up with the Ark of the Covenant. They set it on the stage, and everyone comes dancing down to put their offering in the Ark of the Covenant wow. as their like their act of worship. And I just sat there, and I was just like, dang, you know, I think all of this is so cultural, right? Like. Like this church probably, you know, did a service on worship and, you know, something about flags in the Old Testament or, you know, maybe maybe he did a sermon series on the Ark of the Covenant and worship. And like that was just one service and it became a normative practice after that. And, and I was like, these people have been in this movement so long, they can't even tell um, that these traditions are actually a stumbling block. Yeah. The people that are coming in off the street, they're not looking Oh, oh wow, this Jesus is so weird because he was born of a virgin, died and rose from the dead, ascended into heaven, and is coming down on a white horse. Like, Jesus is enough of a stumbling block. We don't yeah, need exactly. all of the other stuff, yeah. right? Exactly. So, so I want people to reject Christ because he's Christ. Yeah. I do not want them to reject Christ because of something odd and wacky I'm yeah, doing. That's good. And then I started looking inward, and I was like, wait a second. I wonder if I've got any holes in my boat. Mm. Like, I wonder if, if there are things that I'm doing. Cause, cause I had, I had been, I've, I had kept quiet because up until this point that there were some, I was becoming complementarian. Uh, I was, I had, I had some very strong opinions about finances that my charismatic community did not share. Mm. Uh, I was growing in, in tongues and like the, the conversation of tongues and where it says like, Hey, don't speak in tongues publicly. People are gonna think you're babbling idiots mm. coming in. I, I'm going, we're doing this wrong. Yeah. And I had been thinking all of these things for a while. And, and that moment, I just started going, man, I got to start taking this seriously. I think the things that I'm practicing are as much of a stumbling block to these people as this. Yeah. 
Um, and that was probably the first moment that I started taking some of this really seriously. Um, well, you're 20, what just, are you, 21 or 23 now? How old are you about? Oh, uh, I, was probably, I was probably 23 then. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's, it's been a journey. Um, you know, I'll be, I'll be 30 in July. Um, it's not been, it's not been easy in that, um, it's, it's left me homeless, mm. you know? Have a large assembly God friends kind of been frustrated with you or have they been pretty respectful? Well, I was never ordained in the assemblies, okay. um, because, uh, even in Bible school, I had, a, I had a professor who, um, a Bible school, I was in a non-accredited like internship program basically. And, um, and, and while I was there, one of the teachers there, he'd been in the assemblies for a long time, really pushed back against initial physical evidence. Mm. He would say, hey, it can be an evidence, but it's not the evidence. And he still believed in like second blessing, um, but it wasn't like the, it's signed by tongues. Um, and he taught us that. That really probably was the, was that little, that little, uh, I don't know, that prick that, that just kind of like, it would, it would, it would, it would nag at me. I was like, wait, if we're wrong about this, are we wrong about other yeah. things? You know, um, it was actually really good for me to think critically about my movement and critically about the denomination as a whole. Um, frankly, the Assemblies of God is a phenomenal denomination as far as I'm concerned, like paper. Each church is run differently. So some churches are, are wackadoodles, yeah. you know, <laughs> but some churches are like super sound and orthodox. Um, you know, but as like on paper, um, they're, they're an orthodox, they're not hyper charismatic, they're, um, they're a phenomenal denomination. I disagree with um, initial physical evidence. I, I disagree probably with second blessing. I disagree with um, uh, pre-trip rapture. But in the grand scheme of things, like I, everything else of the 16 fundamentals, like that's three of their 16 that I, I can't get down with. But I, I think the rest of them are pretty solid. I mean, it's very orthodox stuff. So, um, you know, we had the, the church that I went to in Illinois wasn't assemblies. So when we moved down, my, Christ, my, my wife attended Christ for the Nations Institute for one semester, and we decided it wasn't for us. But we were just exposed to like that hyper charismatic yeah. community there, um, and just it was just so so not interested. Yeah. <laughs> it's really I can't I don't know how else to say it. I was just like uh, this just isn't for me. Um, I, I had adopted a fourteen year old um, uh, around that time, and me and Rose were sitting in a service. Um, and this guy was was preaching a sermon, and I literally removed Rose from the service. Like I looked over at her, and she looked at me, like, "Is this right?" And I was like, "Let's get out of here." Like she hadn't been for like a couple of weeks, and I was like, "You're not listening to this garbage. Like let's leave." Um, and, and it which wasn't. I don't think I've ever done that before, yeah. where I was in a service and I was just like, "No, nah, this is too far. We gotta go." <laughs> and you have to be careful, uh, especially with if you're with like younger children or stuff, yeah. because they're. They can easily be deceived. Hey guys, thanks so much for joining us on Calvary Conversations. Some resources I would like to share with you guys is Understanding Spiritual Gifts by Sam Storms and Practicing the Power. You guys can purchase these on Amazon and these are good resources if you guys are wanting to know the balance and what it means to be a cessationist and continuationist, but understanding the balance that we need the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. So if you haven't already, please make sure to like, subscribe, and share this video. If you would like to listen to us, wherever you get your podcast, just type in Calvary Conversations. Also, make sure to follow us on Instagram at Calvary Conversations to check out our behind the scenes. And if you would like to order our new merch, our t-shirts, that you can go down below in the description and order that. Thanks so much, guys, and God bless. Hey, guys, thanks again for watching this episode with Joshua Lewis. Again, don't forget to join us this Sunday February 14th at 10 a.m. as Charlie Kirk is coming to speak at our church. You can look down in the description below for our website to check out the location. Hope to see you guys there.